Thanks. Oh, thanks, Imogen. Um, so um, thank you again for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, my name is James Larkin. I'm a medical oncologist at the Royal Marsden uh, in London. Um, and the first session that we're going to have um, today is actually going to be about half an hour, something like that, which is a kind of a game Q&A type of uh, format. So as you can see on the left of that screen, the number of people who are logging on is going up. So we're on about 46 now. That must mean a lot of people in the room still haven't logged on because you can't play the game unless you um, log on. So if, um, could people keep trying, please? Um, there'll be a prize for the winner. Luckily, no, I won't make any jokes. Um, uh, and this first session, Imogen and I talked on the phone a little bit about how we should do this. And um, one of the things was there's a lot of jargon in melanoma, there's a lot of jargon in medicine, there's a lot of jargon in clinical trials. And we thought it would be good actually to have a bit of a session to talk about some of the jargon um, so that um, you know, uh, we can try and understand it a little bit better. And in your bag, there should be this. The language of melanoma. Now, please don't read it now, because you better <laughs> you better cheat. And like, if anybody's cheating, you know, if the neighbours could just sort of like point it out. So anyway, so we, we spent some time actually. Imogen did all the work putting this together before the meeting. So this is a, yes, he did. Um, this is um, this Shy. is a what? Shy. Shy did all the work back there in the green t-shirt. Um, uh, so this this is a, a, a sort of a glossary, sort of a book that we thought people would find helpful to try and understand some of the jargon. We've got 71 players now, so I think we should probably move into the game, otherwise we're going to run out of time at the end. OK. Um, so we have a number of questions um, in this melanoma jargon game. Um, and this is the first question of 11. Um, which of these is true? Melanoma is a fungus. Melanoma is a virus. Melanoma is an infection. Melanoma is a disease. You need to pick that on the device in front of you. Um, there's eight seconds left on the left-hand side of the uh, board. Got 53 answers, 59. Okay, so the right answer in green in the bottom right-hand corner is melanoma is a disease. Um, and uh, 70 people got the right answer on the first question. Okay, so two people didn't. Two people thought it was a virus. Okay. So that was a bit of a warm-up question. Um, let's move on to the next question. Well, before we do that, we have the scores. OK, remember, it's a game. <laughs> so um, there's a time factor here, OK? <laughs> I don't know exactly how it works, um, but obviously, if you're quicker, you get more points, OK? So LD, hands up. Oh, Lucy Davis, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> is currently in the lead with 908 points. Right then, next one please. Right, okay, question two. How many new cases of melanoma were reported in the UK in 2015? Is it about 11,000, about 15,000, about 23,000, or about 78,000? Okay, um, so that's in the UK, new cases of melanoma in 2015. So I think pretty much, oh, I've got 80, oh no, even more people have registered, 85. So the correct answer there is in blue, 15,906. Um, and 34 people got that right. And then 33 went for, for 23,000. So whenever I'm doing a talk, I always point out that the incidence of this disease is still rising pretty much more quickly than any other type of um, solid tumor um, in the UK. And in fact, many countries with the exception um, of Australasia. Uh, and when I started treating melanoma, I'll come back to school, you'll all be looking at the school board by now, but when I, when I started treating melanoma, the incidence was, was pretty much half. Now, Lucy, bad luck. Uh, Paul, <laughs> Paul is now in the lead. Is that you, Paul Nathan? Uh, <laughs> hands up, come on. <laughs> um, right, 1,841. You will not be getting the champagne if you, you'll be getting the dinner, dinner with Mark Middleton if you win. Right, next question, please. <laughs> right, question three, what is a melanocyte? Um, so, someone who likes melons, <laughs> steady, uh, a cell that produces pigments, a cell that destroys other cells, or a cell which carries signals to nerve endings. So, you've got six seconds um, left. Am I doing all right on time, Imogen? Perfect on time, apparently. Okay, very good. Very good. So, the answer in the blue, a cell that uh, produces pigments. So, um, Site just means cell in Latin or Greek, uh, melanocyte, so that's a cell that's producing the melanin pigment. And most people got the, the answer right there. So let's move on to the scoreboard. 
I think we might have to remove Paul Nathan's, <laughs> Paul Nathan's phone, phone from him quite soon. Um, so, question four. What causes um, skin damage, risking melanoma? So, uh, is it universal voluntary radiation? Ultra vicious radiation? Imogen did these, by the way. Uh, ultraviolet radiation? Um, or unseen vexing reactions? So, um, if everyone could make sure they voted. Three seconds to go. Uh, very good. So um, everyone got ultraviolet radiation. So that's really the main reversible we th risk factor that we know about for skin melanoma is ultraviolet radiation. And I think the, the bottom line common sense message there is to avoid sunburn. That's the most important thing, especially in children, basically, um, by all means necessary, actually. So let's move on. So now Paul's um, stepped out. Uh, Foot Angel is now winning. Who's that? Very good. Um, let's move on to the next question. So question five. Now, they're going to get a bit more difficult, I'm afraid. Um, so what, is, what stage is T2B, N1A, M0? So this is not a straightforward question. Is it stage one? Is it stage two? Is it stage three? Or is it stage four melanoma? So pretty much everyone has voted. And the answer is that that is stage three. So actually, I think that's a third of people in the room pretty got the right answer to that. So, I mean, this is not a straightforward question. I suppose the giveaway, just to, 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 to mention there, is that that N1, N stands for lymph nodes, and N1 basically means that you've got involvement of lymph nodes there, which is the same as having stage three. So that, that, that would be a sort of rule of thumb. And M0, M stands for metastatic. That means zero means there is no metastatic melanoma, which would be the, the same as stage four. Stage one and two is, is a primary melanoma, basically. OK, so let's move on. Oh, the, the lead, leaderboards are moving around quite a lot, actually. So who's Charlie? Very good. OK. So uh, let, let, let's move on. Um, halfway through, which of these is not a targeted therapy? Interferon, vemurafenib, trimetinib, and dibrafenib. So vote now. Interferon, vemurafenib, trimetinib, dibrafenib. Very good. So that's three quarters of the people in the room getting that right. So this term targeted therapy tends to refer to these drugs that disrupt signaling processes inside cells. Trimetinib, vemurafenib, dibrafenib are all targeted therapies. They've been developed to treat melanoma in the last sort of five, ten years, something like that. And actually these kinds of drugs have been now developed to treat lots of different types of cancer, not just melanoma. Interferon, as many people know, is a sort of traditional um, so-called cytokine drug, something that stimulates the immune system. So well done, everyone who got that right. Let's go on to the scoreboard again. Well, oh, Charlie remains... Uh, in the lead. Pretty slim margin, though. Imogen's in third. OK, move on, please. I need to stop, because I'm a, I did the question, so I have to stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to get the booby prize if you're not careful. Right, uh, next question. In a phase two trial, it's a phase two trial, the second trial you're allowed to take part in, a trial only for stage two patients, a small-scale trial for stage four patients only, or a trial that is larger than a phase one trial for more people. So vote now. There's only one second left. Um, excellent. Right answer is in green, which almost everybody in the room got right. So a trial that's larger than a phase one trial for more people. So people probably know the first stage of drug testing is phase one, which is usually the first time in humans. Stage two is the next uh, next stage of testing where you're looking more at safety and efficacy and stage three trials tend to be randomized trials there is a stage four as well um, so that's the process for developing drugs actually not just in melanoma not just in oncology but actually broadly um, that's the process of drug development so if we move on to the scoreboard again still pretty close um, but Charlie remains in the lead with I think there's only three or four questions left so next question please question A ipilimumab is not uh, a PD-1 inhibitor, an anti-CTLA-4, a checkpoint inhibitor, an immunotherapy. So again, that's not an entirely straightforward question. Um, so vote now. Four seconds left. There, quite, that's, I thought that was quite a tricky question, actually, Imogen. Um, a lot of double negative risk there. 
So ipilimumab is a, CT, it is a CTLA-4 inhibitor, so it's not a PD-1 inhibitor. Checkpoint inhibitor refers to both of those types of drugs, either anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4. And actually the word immunotherapy, people bandy this around a lot, but it actually refers to any type of treatment that could stimulate the immune system. So it could be a drug like interferon, it could be TILS, it could be all sorts of different treatments. So I think it's important actually to try to get to grips sometimes with all these different things that people talk about, but well done to those who got it right. So, um, aha. So Claire, where are you? Claire is now in the lead. Actually, that's about 300 points, isn't it? Right, next one. Um, question nine, what does LDH stand for? Latent disease heralded, lithium dihydroxyl, left hand drive, or uh, lactate dehydrogenase. So again, in the clinic, this is something we talk about quite a lot, especially when we're thinking about stage four disease, we're thinking about treatment options. So lots of people will have heard about LDH. Um, we have 85 answers, well done. So the answer is lactate dehydrogenase. This is a blood test that we can measure, usually in the situation where people have got stage four disease, which gives us a measurement, if you like, of the speed of change of the melanoma, the prognosis of the melanoma, and it's something that we think about a lot, actually, when we're thinking about drug treatments um, for melanoma. You'll, you'll hear lots about that, I think, during the next day or two. Um, and that's about two-thirds of people got the right answer there. Okay. Lucy is back in the lead there. Uh, <laughs> by 50, you didn't see the questions beforehand, though, did you? No, honestly. Right, okay. Uh, right, the next question, please. <laughs> What does BRAF positive mean? And you sometimes hear the term BRAF mutant as well. They're kind of interchangeable. You have a medicine intolerance. You have B positive blood type. Your tumour has a mutation called BRAF or biradial arterial fractionation, a blood side effect. So uh, four seconds left to go. Um, I think yes. So almost everyone got that. So, so BRAF is a mutation in something called... Uh, a, a protein in the side of the cell, which is one of the drivers in some melanomas that causes the cells to grow and divide and spread around the body, and it's something that we can uh, now target with drugs. Okay, next question. That's about a 500 point lead now. Um, could, could be, last question, what is a placebo? A dummy treatment that looks exactly like the actual drug. A sugary sweet candy that looks like medicine a rare fish found in the Amazon, a stage of gestation where the fetus forms its first limbs, okay? So what is a placebo? Excellent, that's a good one to finish on. So, yeah. so, um, so almost everyone got the right answer to that, so well done, um, almost everybody. Uh, right, um, I, I think, right, let's, let's look at the final scores. Lucy Davis um, is our winner. <laughs> Lucy, come up on stage. What? I really went to the cheek. I was only kidding. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so obviously that was a bit of fun. Um, and it all went through quite quickly. Um, but on a serious point, um, lots of things did come up there. Um, I think we've got a bit of time now if anybody wants to ask any questions about either that or more generally some of the terms um, that we used to talk about in clinic. Um, because I think the jargon... I remember when I was a junior doctor and I first started doing oncology. I mean, you know, oncologists speak a different language than most other doctors, never mind people who aren't medically trained. I think it's quite, it's quite fearsome, actually, sometimes to really understand... Um, what's going on. Imogen has got a microphone. And if no okay. one wants to kick off, Imogen will have to ask the first question. Well. No, I think we've got one. Yeah. Yes, great. Thanks, you were mentioning LDH earlier on. Um, I'm, a, I'm a type 4. What, I obviously look at my LDH whenever I see it. What, what can I read into it as a, as a layman, please? Well, LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, is a blood test that's been around for decades. Um, it's, it's not something new, it's actually not particularly sophisticated in many ways, and it's a sort of a, a, a measurement of sometimes inflammation or sometimes damage to cells, and they release uh, this substance, which is an enzyme, into the bloodstream. And actually what we know with cancer, not just melanoma, is that having a, a raised LDH, so each hospital will have its own 
uh, range of numbers. There's about four or five different ranges, but the melanomas in stage four that have got a higher LDH tend to be the faster growing melanomas. That's probably the best way um, to think about it. Um, whether it can be used to monitor response to treatment is quite a good question, and people ask about that a lot. And I know that certainly in our patients, people are, are looking at their LDH a lot. I don't think it, I don't think it, it can sometimes be used to monitor response to treatment, but I wouldn't set too much store by it, is what I would say, actually. I think certainly for me, or, or for us, one of the, the most useful things about LDH is in planning treatment. So... Let's say you have a situation where there's stage four melanoma, different parts of the body are affected. Um, LDH might be one of the things that you're taking into account in determining which treatment to go for. Um, but other things to take into account would be someone's symptoms, level of fitness, whether they've got any other medical problems. Sometimes you might have a choice between intravenous treatments and tablets and that kind of thing. So what I'm really trying to say is that, and I've got a slide of this somewhere, actually it's one of the factors you might think about when you're planning treatment um, for stage four disease. Okay, any other questions? How much time do we have, Imogen? You have another 12 minutes. Another? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Front. Hello. I get, when I see my oncologist, I get my reports printed out for me. Chris, I, lift the mic just slightly up. When I see my oncologist, I ask for my report so I can get my report and, and look at my Scan situation. Yeah, as yeah. a situation going. Can these be made in a standard format? Because every radiologist sends each one differently. And every one to me is totally different. And I have a job to understand each one from the last one. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. And people ask that a lot. Well, first of all, um, a scan report is an opinion of a radiologist. So I would say that, you know, they, an opinion. So the, the scans are done, um, and I'd love it if scans were black and white, but they're not. They're by definition shades of grey. And a radiologist will give an interpretation, an opinion on that scan. There are ways to try and standardise that, and one of the, the ones that we use in clinical trials is called RESIST, which stands for a Response Evaluation Criteria in Solid Tumours. And so that's a system, basically, of measuring abnormalities on scans adding them all together. And that sounds sort of black and white and scientific, but it's not. There's shades of gray there as well. And if you added the size of lots of abnormalities together, let's say before you started a treatment, and then you did another scan after two or three months, you then might do the same exercise, add them together, and then you could generate a percentage for increase or reduction in the abnormalities, which might give you some sort of measurement of the success of the treatment. But that's generally only used within trials, and even that's quite a blunt tool, basically. So, so one of the problems people have with scans is exactly what you said. The, the, the scans are the radiologist giving an opinion, if you like, on the overall state of the cancer to the oncologist or the oncology team to try to help, I would say, in assessing the overall situation for a patient. And, and, um, but what I always say to my patients is number one, and I'll repeat it, scans are all about shades of grey, I'm afraid, whether we like it or not, that's number one. They're often difficult to interpret, particularly with immunotherapy treatment. Scans are sometimes notoriously difficult to interpret. But scans are not the be-all and end-all of how we make assessments, I would say. And, and I, you know, I, I, again, people who know me will know this. Actually, th what someone's like, how they feel is the number one thing. It's not about scans. Scans are helpful, and blood tests can sometimes be helpful. But actually, I think the thing is about putting it all together and talking to someone about how they feel. So it's a long answer, but that's really what I think about scans. So I'm afraid, there are, in, my, in my opinion and, and knowledge, there isn't an easy way to standardise it other than the use of resist in trials, which is a very technical um, kind of exercise. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Great question, though. Really good. I'm sure lots of people got that question in their mind. So I epically another failed by got another my question phone there, No, I just, I went to turn my phone on to silent. All right. Got another question here. Um, <clears throat> when you've had immunotherapy uh, and you come off it after you've had uh, 22 treatments, the bit that worries you is, is it still working inside your body? And, and is there any gauge from all the uh, blood samples you have or any other method to say... We're all looking for longevity of life. What's, what's the, obviously you have your three monthly scans. 
to start off with, what's, we, we've just talked about that, but what is, the, um, what is the research that you found on longevity from coming off of immunotherapy, if it's worked really well? Yeah, so there's, that's another really, really good question, which covers a lot of different things. So at the moment, in any situation, um, scans are really one of the main tools that we use, as I've just said, to assess what's happening with, with actually any cancer that's spread. This isn't just about melanoma. And it's kind of unsatisfactory in a way because you'd like to think it's 2018. Can't we do anything you know, more sophisticated than that? And actually, Paul Nathan and I, just before we started this meeting, were actually um, having a, a, a telephone call, teleconference, about a trial that we're trying to set up in the UK to try and look at circulating tumour DNA. So that's a blood test, basically, to try and work out whether circulating tumour DNA or just a blood test might be more sensitive, potentially, in trying to detect if a cancer is coming back, in this case melanoma, but it's been applied to other cancers as well, whether that information is useful and whether it can be acted on in some way to improve treatment. So in, in other types of cancer, and the best examples are in um, things like leukaemias, they do have blood tests that they can use to monitor the progress of the cancer, uh, and it, it makes a, a, a vast difference um, for patients. But with most solid tumours, we're just at the infancy, but I think it's a really, really promising technology, and there's a massive amount of effort going into this. So, so we're hoping to bring a trial to the UK in the relatively near future where we can look at that. I just want to talk, comment about the duration of immunotherapy as well, because that's a really, really important question, I think. So we know that IPI on its own, and I talk about this a lot, Sandra's sitting there. Um, for most people realise the reference, um, Sandra's um, Guardian, February 2016, I think. Um, IPI on its own is a treatment we've used in trials for around about 10 years, and, and that treatment can result in about 20% of people in very long-term survival. But IPI on its own is four treatments. That's it. You stop. Three months of treatment. So we know that with checkpoint inhibitors, so drugs like IPI, but, but probably also the newer ones like pembrolizumab and nivolumab and others, you might not need that much treatment. And we're beginning to see that, I think, now um, with some of the more recent drugs that we've used where sometimes we stop them, IPI and Nevo together is the classic example, in the first few weeks of treatment for bad side effects. And we're certainly beginning to see people, and all of us, I'm sure I speak for my colleagues as well, we have people, and there'll be people in the room as well, who've had only, only had one or two treatments, and it's worked really, really well. You know, the disease has been controlled for, you know, a year, two years, three years. We don't know enough yet about the newer combination treatments to know if that's really going to last into the long term, but I think it probably often will, actually. So the point is you might not need that much treatment. I think what we really need is to try to individualise, and it's the same point, actually, the, the amount of treatment for the person and for the melanoma. So maybe there are people who need treatment for long periods of time. Maybe they need, there are people who need treatments for, for less periods of time. The final bit of this is that um, drugs like pembrolizumab and nivolumab, the data certainly for pembrolizumab from trials now, is that two years of treatment may be enough for lots of people who get to the two-year time point, okay? If, let's say you've been on pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And what we know now is that for people who get to the two-year time point and they're doing well, about 80 or 90% of people may well never need to have further treatment. So lots of people are now having these discussions in the clinic, I'm sure, about stopping treatment in two years, which is what you referred to. Um, the difficulty there, I think, for all of us is that we as oncologists, and again, I think I can speak for my colleagues, several, several of whom are around the room at the moment, would like to be able to say to people, if you're in the unlucky 10% of people, or whatever it is, or 15% of people, the melanoma does start growing down the line, we'd like to be able to give you the treatment again. And I don't think I'm saying anything controversial at the moment. As the NHS rules are set up, we're not allowed to do that. And actually, that's something we're working on with melanoma focus. Pippa's, I just, the Pippa's there, and um, Paul and I have discussed this a lot, and other people as well, and Simon Rodwell's in the room as well. So. That's, that's going to be really, really important for us because that's something that we'd like to do. But they're sort of bureaucratic battles, I'm afraid, that we'll, um, we'll need to fight. But just to get back to where I started, it might even be that much less treatment with, say, pembrolizumab and nivolumab is required for some people. And, and maybe we could monitor that with blood tests or something like that. So there's, there's, there's attempts in this space as well. So there's a trial called Dante, which many people know about, which is looking at the duration of anti-PD-1 treatment. So, so I think there's been, I'd summarise all of this by saying we've had loads of progress in the last five or 10 years, which is obviously wonderful, but we've still got a lot more to do 
and trying to work out how to use the drugs better to minimise side effects and, and, and really to maximise the chances of long-term cure. That's, a, that's how I see it. And we, we've still got a lot of work to do now, I think. If Imogen allows it, she's Yeah, the that's fine. Are we on, how are we on time? You good? Like, tell me a number. Okay. This, is, this, is, this, is, this is perhaps something, uh, perhaps, perhaps should just be between my oncologist and myself, but being as you're here and we, we're talking, well, I might as well ask the question. I was on Ipi for a while, and Ipi wasn't working, so I went on to Pembro. I've been on Pembro now for two years, and my last scan said there's no sign of cancer in your body, which after what I've gone through, I, I find a job to believe. But listening to you talking now, there is a possibility then that after two years on Pembro, it could actually be that I'm coming away and not having... Yes, yeah, it's cancer. definitely a possibility, and I think, I think that is a discussion to have with your team, actually. Yeah. It's, it's not, it, it is a discussion. I mean, I don't think we're completely clear-cut here, but certainly with our patients, we have this discussion for people who've got to two years, let's say, with Pembro. You, you surprised me by saying that after two years, people were finding it, it was curing them, which is... Well, all I can tell you is that there's a, a trial that, that, that we and others around the world have been involved in, we in the UK have been involved in, where... And probably lots of people in the room were in the trial, it was Kino 006, um, where treatment was stopped at two years, and people were followed up, and the latest follow-up, which has just been presented at ASCO, sort of over a year later, was that 80 or 90% of people who'd stopped at two years, their melanoma remained under control and they didn't need to have further treatment. That's, that's what's informing us, I think, in the oncology community. Um, and that's, yeah, Paul. I'm going to show those slides. Yeah, so Paul, I'm spoiling Paul's can talk. I, can I, can yeah. I just follow that up then? Can I, I know this is perhaps just following. Can I just say that, in my case, if it is found to be not in the next scan, and I come off, what's the chance of getting back onto treatment? If well, I that's exactly what I just said, basically. So as things stand at the moment, we as oncologists are not allowed to subsequently treat people if the melanoma gets worse down the line. And to be blunt, that's something that we disagree with, I think pretty strongly, actually. And we're doing pretty much all we can uh, within our powers. I think that's a fair statement at the moment as well, to try to reverse that. That stuff is taking place at the moment behind closed doors because that's probably the initial approach that we hope will be successful. But watch this space. I can't really say any more than that, I don't think, at this stage. I'm getting nods, I think, from my colleagues as well. And we're probably up. Excellent. On three minutes. And yeah. you're going to introduce the next Yes, speaker. I will. So but just before I do, um, James and I worked putting this Language of Melanoma booklet together. It is in your bags. This is the jargon booklet. There are physical copies. If you're a medical professional here and you want to take extra copies back to hand out at your clinics or to give to other colleagues, there's a table at the back with a whole load more of these and all other of the bits of the literature in your bags. This is also going to be published when I get round to it, probably in a week and a half's time, as a PDF on my website, on the patient conference website, so it can be downloaded and accessed directly from there. James and I will be working with Shai and Ollie from Health Anatomy to keep this updated. So if you do spot a term or a phrase that isn't in the book that you think should be in the book, please let me know. We will work and we'll have frequent meetings and discussions to make sure that the PDF gets updated and then the printed copy gets updated as well. I really, really hope that you find this useful. Um, James and I really thought it was important to, to help improve your knowledge and if not improving your knowledge as a general rule, then giving you a tool that you could look at and refer back to after oncology appointments. Yeah, exactly. And, and in a way, this is just the first version. I mean, we're not saying it's definitive or anything, but so, so we'd, we'd love to get some feedback on that for the second version, which hopefully we could have next year. Absolutely. How about that? Thank you very much, Dr. James Larkin. Okay, next session. Um, Dr.